thanks for having me, uh, having me here today. Really excited to present my work. So, uh, as I think he mentioned, uh, this is very much a uh, working draft. Okay, <laughs> this is a working project. It's a co-authored work with my uh, co-authors Richard Saul from Queen Mary, uh, uh, Queen Mary University of London. Um, and though it's uh, just a work in, in progress, I do hope that the kind of general outline I'm giving today will spark your interest. And also, I very much would appreciate your comments. So any, you know, anything you have to say afterwards, I'd love to hear it. Now, we have a pretty small group here today, so I don't usually do this. But if, if I'm speaking and you have uh, just a, a question they really need to ask me, I'm happy to take some questions in the middle uh, of the lecture. If there's anything you're not, uh, you're not following or anything like that, any concept you're not following, uh, or just want to throw something out there, please uh, just raise your hand. Also, please do let me know if I'm speaking too fast. So. I get this in my lectures with my students. I speak really fast sometimes, and I just tell them, just raise your hand or just tell me, slow down, you know, just, just let me know, all right? Okay, so uh, as the title of the two lectures indicate, the book uh, Rick and I are writing is trying to rethink the role of the far right in race in the making of uh, what a number of scholars have called the U.S.-led liberal international order, okay, this U.S.-led liberal international order that was established after 1945. Okay, so the aim of the book is to provide a radically different perspective on this Cold War geopolitical order, and in particularly the politics and the geopolitics that are going on within the so-called Western alliance. So today, this lecture is going to be focusing on developments within the uh, Western European states, and then tomorrow we're going to be looking at the U.S. context. Okay, so, so why study the far right? Right? Why study the far right and its relationship in particular to this liberal international order? Why do it today? Well, a number of things. All right? Obviously, there's been some recent political events that are somewhat germane to studying the far right. Okay, we can talk about the uh, recent election of Donald Trump to the presidency of the United States on a very xenophobic, hyper-nationalist platform. We can point to uh, the Brexit, the British uh, referendum to leave the, Euro the uh, European Union. Both of these events, along the kind of broader kind of rise of the far right across Western Europe and, and much of the world, in fact, uh, have been seen as the clearest challenge to some of the core foundations of this liberal international order that was established in 1945. Right? And these, these events have really led to an outpouring of scholarly and journalistic commentary on these events. Some even pointing to the possibility of a, a kind of imminent decline of U.S. hegemony in the liberal international order as we know it. <coughs> However, I think that, for the most part, these responses to this current conjunction, this, both within the scholarly literature and the kind of more op-ed type pieces you might read in the Washington Post, have really overlooked the importance of the far right in the longer term for this order. Okay? They've really overlooked the central contribution to the far right in the making of this liberal international order in the first place. And this extends to the dominant theorizations within my own home discipline of international relations, all right? And just to let you know, the acronym for international relations is IR, okay? So IR approaches have tended to emphasize this international order's post-fascist dimensions that really reflect the liberal and democratic characteristics of the states involved in creating these, uh, this order, okay? And, and, and in this lecture, I'd like to uh, at least probe and possibly challenge this depiction of the international order. And I want to do so in particular by not only highlighting the continued presence of the far right in Western European polities after 1945, but also by looking at their distinct contribution to the development of this order. Right? And I do so by drawing attention to the construction and maintenance of a number of distinct domestic anti-communist political orders that extended across a number of the major states involved in making this uh, in the making of this international liberal order. Okay, so the emphasis here is going to be on these mutual interconnections between domestic and international order building that not only underscore some neglected aspects of Cold War history, but also uh, problematizes uh, and gives a different view on the specific ideological and political properties of this geopolitical order. Okay, so the first part of the lecture, I'm going to briefly discuss some prominent IR approaches, and I'm going to focus in particular on the work of G. John Eikenberg, for reasons I will be uh, discussing in a moment. Now, I'm also going to be looking uh, in particular about how IR defines orders, right, geopolitical orders, and how they connect it 
to uh, the specific uh, social and institutional arrangements of the states making up those orders. Right? So what I'm going to be showing is that most IR approaches work with what, what they call in the discipline a domestic analogy. Okay? They work from looking at and examining at some specific arrangement within states, and they extrapolate that to looking at how that order is built at the geopolitical level. Okay, so then after this, I'm going to identify some of the limitations of these existing approaches while examining the connections, the structural connections, between the far right and liberal orders more generally over a kind of long array perspective. All right, so here I'll be sketching out uh, the alternative framework, theoretical framework that I'm going to be drawing on, which uh, includes the concept of uneven combined development, and Antonio Gramsci's particular conceptualization of hegemony and his uh, term passive revolution. And then finally, I'm going to provide a broad brush kind of empirical overview of some of the key trends and the key uh, developments in regards to uh, the strategic place of the far right in the making of this order. And I say broad, and I'm not going to really be focusing too much on the history here, simply because if you're interested in that, it's in the paper upon which this is based on, this lecture is based on, and that will be read on Thursday. So if you're interested in what I have to say here, you want to know more, besides asking questions after the lecture, come to Thursday and email Patrick for the paper. Okay. So let's get right into it then. So the study of international order within IR forms obvious a voluminous literature. Right? There's, there's a ton of work there. There's a lot of literature there. There's not as much on the geopolitical order of the uh, post-war 1945 period. There's a bit. But with specific reference to this uh, Cold War geopolitical order, really the work that's been the most influential, and at least within what we might call mainstream or traditional IR approaches, the work that's been most influential and the most extensive is John, uh, G. John Eikenberry. Okay? He's a liberal IR scholar. He works in the United States. Uh, he's had positions within various administrations, from the Bush 1 administration to the Obama administration, uh, and he works at Princeton. He's a, a chair professor at Princeton. So his work's been very influential, and for this reason alone, I think, merits some scrutiny. Okay, so central to Eikenberry analysis is on the liberal democratic constitution of the Western power involved in making of this international order. Okay, so for Eikenberry, what's specifically important is the democratic character of those states, right, party to such an order, that gives the order such highly positive effects. So what does he mean by positive? What he means by positive is that it was so durable, right, that it could last various crises and different conjunctures, and they could last past the Cold War itself. Right? The fact that this cold, this the essential architecture, NATO, European Union, right, uh, WTO, all these other things, this essential architecture that was put together after the Second World War continues to this very day. And right? so this was a highly stable, right? Uh, or capable of lasting up to the present day. And the reasons, one of the key reasons that he uh, argues this is true is it because of the liberal democratic characteristics of the institutions involved. And in particular, the way in which these institutions could bind power. They were strategically restraining the most dominant power of that time, which was the United States. Right? So as Eikenberry puts it, European and American leaders argued quite explicitly that their willingness to establish binding ties with each other hinged on their shared democratic institution. Democracy was both an end and a means. So as we can see here, and as I indicated before in the lecture, Eikenberry is working with what we call a domestic analogy, very explicitly so. So that is to say that the internal constitution of the parties, the states that were involved in making the order, is what you need to know about, uh, what you need to know to assess the character of that order. It reflects these internal properties. And what's also particularly significant for Eikenberry is the politically open and reciprocal uh, nature of the American state. And this politically open and reciprocal nature is what gave the US uh, exercise of hegemony after the 1945 its distinctly liberal cast. Okay, so the ac exercise of US power was articulated through a historically singular form of what Eikenberry calls liberal hegemonic leadership. Liberal hegemonic leadership. So US hegemony was much less coercive than it's often assumed within both Marxist and IR literatures, and often less successful in imposing its own will. Right? This was very much according to Eikenberry at least, a bargain and negotiated order, right, where other allies, right, other states could put, uh, had input into this order. And in some regards, he's correct in that. Okay, so Eikenberry's conception of U.S. hegemony, 
also share some broad, and I, I say broad, stress on the broad, affinities with other critical approaches to IR. Particularly, we see uh, neo-Marxists that view the post-war uh, uh, order as being achieved through the formation of what they call a new transnational historical bloc. Okay, this transnational historical blo uh, bloc is kind of social political alliance, so it's more than that. We can talk about that in the next lecture. You can ask me in the, in the, uh, the question and answer. Right? It's a kind of social political alliance that brought together these centrist elements, these liberal forces right, within the state apparatus, within the major parties in the, in the the major mainstream parties in different states, right? they brought them together to consciously aim to create this transatlantic political community, a transatlantic political commu community that was liberal. They were creating a geopolitical order in the image of themselves. Right? They were creating a geopolitical order in the image of themselves. And while giving analytical primacy to capitalist political economy and class agency, they therefore share, in certain respects, and Eikenberry's emphasis on civil society as the terrain or space where hegemony is constructed and consolidated. Moreover, both accounts also share this focus on these internal properties of the states making this order, to then assess what type of order is being made. But I would also say that both with Eikenberry and other liberal IR accounts, and these more critical neo-Marxist accounts, there's very little discussion of the central strategic place of non-liberal far-right social forces in the making of these orders. And even when there is some empirical discussion, I'll give you an example, uh, Kais van der Peil's work, for example, does take into account the role of the far-right, but even there, there's no, there's no attempt to kind of fit this empirical account, this recognition of these forces with a more substantive theoretical conception of their relationship to the building of this order. Right? So it's there, it's empirically present, but it's not theorized. Right? And I would argue that this weakens in some regards their respective analyses, and in the case of Eikenberry and other liberal approaches, really misconstrues the nature and evolution of the Cold War. Okay, so before turning to the Cold War era, I think it's important to identify how our argument, again, this is a co-authored piece for those who are walking in late, how our argument relates to wider conceptions, wider arguments about liberal order. Okay, so viewed from this kind of broader historical uh, <coughs> perspective, we can identify not only the connections between the far right and the contemporary liberal order, but also tease out some of these structural continuities uh, that define the ontology of liberalism as a distinct political order. Okay, liberal orders from the 19th century to pr present have maintained and retained an ambivalent relationship with the far right. And such ambivalence of, uh, ambivalences, which at times have turned into open embraces, we argue to, uh, derive from a few particular structural properties of liberal orders in general. The first of these is this recurrent phenomenon uh, uh, produced by the destabilizing consequences of the uneven and combined character of capitalist development, and thus the periodic crises that have punctuated its history. All right, I'm, I've kind of put up here very briefly what, what I mean by uneven and combined development here. I don't want to go over that too much now. We can go over in the, uh, in the question and answer if you like. But specifically what I'm looking at here is the fusion of what Trotsky called, this is Trotsky's concept, of the archaic and the modern, how this is central to the understanding of the persistence of the far right and its relationship and reproduction within these liberal international orders. For this process of uneven combined development, the changes it unleashes and the reconfiguration of social orders that have resulted in its wake provide the, so the structural context from which the far right first emerged and from which it is reproduced. Right, so I'm talking about these geopolitically driven, uh, intensified forms of development that cause various disruptions and dislocations of social order. Okay, that's what, what I'm talking about, uneven combined development. And so what, generally speaking, what we can see is that the far right deploys archaic, reactionary, ideological uh, elements to mobilize a popular base in reaction to these rapid social and cultural disruptions wrought by this process. Right. Indeed, the very possibilities of the politics of the far right come from the fundamental ways in which political, political subjectivities are framed and conditioned by these dislocations produced by capitalist development in its international dimensions. Right. So we can think about here 
concrete examples of kind of political economy and inter interimperialist rivalry during the interwar periods, right? This is key to the success of far-right mobilizations and their uh, actual ability to maintain uh, or to uh, come to power, that is, right? So the key here is these geopolitics, too, right? the geopolitics driving uh, these developments. So in short, the history of capitalist development have provided the socioeconomic topography upon which far-right ideological imaginaries thrive. And it's these imaginary, imaginaries that have been central to reconstituting the meaning and terrain of the political, and in particular the ways in which they construct individual identities as connected to a racially or ethnically defined people. Right? So the far-right provides a kind of organicist conception of the nation-state which is defined by a racially homogeneous people. Right? And this is the way it copes with these, this is a kind of response, the way it copes with these crises produced by this uneven capitalist development. Obviously, that's not the only reason that explains it. This is just one aspect. I don't want to sound too reductionist there. Okay, so what we see then is that the far right has offered an important, if in many ways, illusory ideological exit strategy from the organic stabilities and crises of capitalist modernity. Right? It constitutes a form of politics that's defined by a mythical presentation of the past, idealized in racial or ethnic terms. Right? So this provides a kind of reproduction of the past and the present, what Trotsky called this contradictory amalgam of archaic and contemporary force. This is at the heart of what a combined development is about, okay? this contradictory fusion of what is supposed to be present and what is supposed to be past. So secondly, the political basis upon which liberal orders have come to rest have, in certain conjunctures, come to rely on far-right far right mobilization to secure them. Right, so at moments of crisis, the far-right has come to provide an important ideological anchor to compensate for the intense dislocations and sense of anime that have characterized such conjunctures. So we see here that the structural dynamics of capitalism generates what we might call a kind of the far right as a form of uh, coercive reserve army that politicians and ruling classes can take advantage of in times of crisis. Now, to be clear, what we're not suggesting is that the far right should be viewed as a type of uh, pawn of ruling class interests, parroting the kind of Stalinist uh, thesis on fascism, right? We're not saying that it's just simply an articulation of the interests of monopoly capital. We're also not claiming that the far right is necessarily functional to the reproduction of capitalist order. As the interwar period and the uh, Second World War proves uh, uh, so dramatically, it can be very dysfunctional, right? And in fact, in the contemporary order, we might see just how dysfunctional that might be. I mean, think about the type of xenophobic immigration policies that, 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 that the far right in the United States are pushing for. This is dysfunctional to big capital in many ways. All right? So that is not what we're arguing. Rather, what we're trying to, to show, what we're trying to argue for, is the need to recognize the political role of far right forces in helping to thwart re revolutionary impulses uh, uh, challenges to liberal capitalist orders, and the, role, the way in which the far right can then offer an alternative source of ideological limitation, legitimation, excuse me, well, limitation, legitimation of these capitalist orders that aren't necessarily antithetical to them, right? And then we have to see how this links up, or can link up, to conceptions of international order as well. Okay, so here the question of hegemony uh, really becomes central. So we follow Antonio Gramsci, the uh, great Italian Marxist, who was jailed by Mussolini in the 19, uh, well, 1920s and 1930s. We follow Gramsci by looking and understanding hegemony as the dialectical fusion of three elements, consens uh, consensus and coercion, uh, leadership and domination, and legitimacy and corruption. All right? And the point that we really try to stress is that you have to ensure that you're always keeping these two dimensions of this dialectical equation in play. Right? At least within international relations, you see the dominant uh, uh, theorizations really only looking at hegemony as consensus or leadership, or on the other hand, it's completely domination. Right? <coughs> and the reason why hegemony becomes, <coughs> becomes so important is because it's the historical conditions <coughs> that rise to strong far-right movements are those in which the hegemony of the ruling class order comes under threat. 
And of course, this is precisely the situation that Gramsci found himself in the interwar years with the rise of Nazi and fascist movements into power, where the far right was viewed by many ruling classes as both a challenge to the order and also a possible solution to reconsolidate, reconsolidating capitals together. And this was actually explicitly recognized by some circles within these ruling classes within Germany on the eve of the Nazi takeover. So I'm going to give you just a quick illustration here. There was a very uh, influential bi-weekly private newsletter called the Deutsche Führerbrief. It was run by uh, an, a business association. By that time, I think it was mostly dominated by heavy industrial interests, but it had all the different kind of factions of capital involved in it, agricultural interests, uh, IG Farben, all of them. And they published this newsletter, and it circulated to the leading echelons of the German ruling class. It even went to the most immediate circle right around Hindenburg, uh, right before the Nazi takeover, including all the major military officials uh, in Germany. And very tellingly, in a September 1932 uh, uh, article uh, of this new newspaper, they argued for the necessity of including the Nazis in any future government that was to be established to ensure its popular legitimacy. The, the article was called The Social Reconsolidation of German Capitalism, and in it it argues Quote, the problem of consolidating a bourgeois regime and regime in post-war Germany is in general determined by the fact that the leading group, namely the bourgeoisie operating the economy, has become too narrow to account for its own rule. For this hegemony, it needs to bind itself to a layer that are not part of it socially, but which provide the essential service of anchoring its hegemony within the people, etc., etc., and then become the final support, the final anchor of this hegemony. So right out of the horse's mouth, <laughs> right? Recognize they, in moments of crisis, in moments of, de, uh, uh, of desperation, right, we see that the political, the principal political representatives of the bourgeoisie couldn't find a solution out of this crisis of Germany that faced them. And in this moment of desperation, at least some of them right, were willing right, to, to think beyond the box, right, to think that maybe we need to rely on someone else outside of our, kind of our, our, own, our own social layers. Uh, to anchor our hegemony, right? So they turned to the far right. They turned to the far right in doing so. And once in power, these Nazis and fascist regimes facil facilitated what Gramsci termed a passive revolution. That is a form of revolution from above that involves a molecular process of transformation. This is a pr process that progressively modified the pre-existing composition of forces, that is social forces, in the ruling class's gradual but continuous absorption of subaltern class demands. Right? So what this means is that the ruling classes built an order that simultaneously incorporates some demands of the, of the underclasses, of the working class, of the proletariat and peasants, while dramatically limiting and de-radicalizing them and reproducing and restructuring the political rule of capital. Right? So it's, a, it's almost... You, know, you incorporate some of these, you absorb some of these demands, but you behead right, the, the social forces behind them. And we can see that the emergence of these passive revolutions were also organically co connected to what Nicholas Short calls the praxeological challenge of uneven development. That is to say, a political and ideological strategy that was aimed at coping with these destabilizing pressures wrought by the geopolitically conditioned character of capitalist development. So in this way, we make an argument in the book that we have to see these concepts of passive revolution and uneven combined development as organically intertwined. OK, so you're going to tell me that, OK, this is all well and good, but this is the interwar period. What the hell does this have to do with the post-war period? Or what does it have to do with the contemporary period? Right? Because obviously, the, the entire argument of Eikenberry's other is that there's something unique about this post-war period, right? These fascists have been, uh, uh, have been uh, it's a post-fascist settlement. These fascist uh, uh, forces have been expo uh, exposed from the West European scene, right? And that's what makes this settlement so democratic, so liberal, and thus so unique, right? However, as we show in the manuscript, far from terminating this crisis, this organic crisis that spans the interwar year period, the immediate post-war period saw a recurrent state of punctuated and acute crises of hegemony across Western Europe. And further, it was the particular ways in which these crises were resolved and the involvement of far-right forces in their resolution that significantly determined the precise political character of the, of the order that took thereafter, okay, of the liberal international order. 
right? And indeed, what we see is that the reconstitution of Western state society relations involves both the molecular absorption and thus limiting of non communist leftist social forces and demo democratic demands into new state society relations. And secondly, that there's, to balance this, there's a reappropriation and incorporation of far right forces and ideological currents into these same structures. So in these ways, you have this transformation of Western European state society relations that undergoes its own unique type of passive revolution, right? This reconstruction and reconsolidating, reconsolidation of the political rule of capital. And in so doing, it combines liberal and regressive forces into a single hegemonic process, project, excuse me. A project that coheres together around a shared common sense of vitriolic anti-communism. Right, that's the defining ideological ethos of this order. It's defining political orientation, the quilting point, the ideological quilting point, bringing and coalescing these different and disparate social forces. And most importantly, it's in times of hegemonic crisis that, it's, that the far right elements of this, of this uh, hegemonic project are called up, right, or brought to emerge as the subterranean anchor of liberal capitalist orders. So what our analysis highlights then is that there's a strong, long-standing structural weaknesses, weaknesses within liberalism, both as an ideology and as an institutional, institutionalization of politics, more so than many traditional accounts uh, within international relations have taken into account. All right, so this broad uh, overview provides us an important historical backdrop from which we can situate the Cold War order. And as noted, prevailing conceptualizations of the post-war international order point to a number of mutually reinforcing domestic and international transformations. Right? These, these transformations, these two changes, developed out of what uh, uh, Jeff Ely, the Michigan historian, calls the high point of the, ra of the radical democratic impulse that accompanied the liber liberation of Europe from fascist forces between about 1942 to 1947. Right? And here, he argues that the forces of the left, he among others, captured the radical democratic possibilities bequeathed by the liberation, and that for this brief moment, the left was momentarily hegemonic, at least in ideological and political terms. Right? So this, these changes not only reflected the temporary weakness and, and disorientation of dominant classes, but also the momentary banishment of the far right from mainstream politics. Right? For, so for dominant accounts of the emergence of the post-war geopolitical order, it's exactly these changes that are, are provided as evidence of the democratic dimensions of the transformations at the geopolitical level. Right? They point to the same very processes, without, of course, not naming that it's the communist parties in Italy, that it's the communist parties in France that are actually doing this, that are the ones that are hegemonic. Right? So the democratic transformation heralded by the defeat of fascism is then quite explicitly recognized as directly connected to the broader forces Right? of the left, even if they're not naming it, right? they're recognizing that it's there. Right? And the consolidation and deepening of these democratic possibilities after the war were to be determined by the continuing strength of the left. So what this suggests then is that at the war's end, there exists a possibility for the emergence of a very different form of liberal democratic order with very big implications for the type of geopolitical order from which it emerged. Right? And all of the scholars looking at this liberal international order being built point to the very same processes that I'm looking at here. So what happens then? Why doesn't this emerge? Right? What we see in the period after 1945, or really more 1947, is a number of developments come to produce a kind of reinforcing uh, dynamic, right, playing out of the, again at the domestic and international levels. Right? And this creates this international order that uh, liberal scholars and others like Eikenberry are trying to account for and celebrate. So at the international level, the, this dynamic is driven by the responses to the perceived aggressions of the Soviet Union, perceived and real, I should say, right, which reinvigorates the forces of the right across Western Europe and also brings the United States right, further into the security military relations of the West European states and also intervening in governing these uh, intrastate European relations. Okay, so it's bringing the U.S. more into it, making them become more involved than they would have uh, had this not happened, say. 
At the domestic level, the key developments include the rapid rehabilitation of the fascist right and the creation of new national hegemonic projects. These are projects that then uh, included former fascist and were pre premised on this virulent anti-communism. An anti-communism that extends beyond the communist left. Right? It's not just about stopping the communists, but stopping any of them. Okay, so what we see then is that within the space of about three to four years, the possibility of a so-called democratic springtime had given way to a narrowly conceived, far-right tainted liberal order at both the domestic and liberal, and excuse me, liberal, domestic and international levels, right? And these transformations that we see occurring across Western Europe are highly uneven. Right? After the initial wave of anti-fascist purges, we see the return of former fascists in power in Germany, in France, or no, in Germany and Italy, and then the collaborators, or quote, unquote, fellow travelers, being put back in power in France and Greece. And these are the four main case studies that we look at in the book for this period. And I'm just going to focus very briefly on one of these case studies, Western Germany. Okay, so after the initial purge, the Nazis, the war crime tribunals, uh, within two years, most of the Nazis were allowed back into their posts. Most of those Nazis who had been in state power before the war are allowed back into their posts. Out of the 53,000 53, state functionaries originally dismissed by the Western Allies due to their Nazi connection, only 1,000 were permanently banned. Okay, only 1,000 are permanently excluded. And in the case of the judiciary, almost every single former Nazi is brought back into power. So the entire legal system of the new republic, the new West German Republic, is in the hands of former Nazis, right? leading echelons of this judiciary. And as the Allies move to reinstate Nazis into power, they're also moving to repress the left. And this comes to a, a kind of boiling point uh, ahead with the outlawing of the German Communist Party in August 1956. So the ideological creed of the new West German state is marked by this hyper, uh, visceral anti-communism. And arguably, this is the defining political orientation of all the post-war intellectual elites, political elites, and economic elites. It comes close to replicating the kind of hyper, uh, hysterical paranoia of the German ruling caste during the Weimar Republic, with the significant caveat that during the Weimar Republic, the German Communist Party was actually allowed to operate, unlike in the, the post-war period. Right? Further, what we see with this repopulation of the state with former Nazis, or what Adam Call calls fellow travelers, it helps to determine the specific character of the liberal international order that emerged. So the possibility of remaking the West German state, and with it the wider uh, uh, European order, is radically limited by this defining anti-communist ethos. And this, in particular, serves to reinforce both the division of Cold War Europe and also Germany itself. Right? So it's essentially this anti-communist drive that is uh, uh, creating a divided Germany. There were, however, as we look in the book, very real political alternatives to this type of geopolitical order, type of liberal uh, order, that were effectively blocked by American and German elites. Right? These alternatives were as hostile to the Cold War division of Europe and Soviet maneuvering in Central Eastern Europe, as they were to the type of tainted political compromise that defined the German Republic in the early post-war period. And this political alternative is probably best exemplified by the Social de Democrats under the leader of Kurt Schumacher. All right? While ambivalent, if not entirely hostile, to West German communists, the SPD was more seriously committed to denazification. And it also held a very different geopolitical orientation based on a demilitarized, and neutral but unified Germany. Right? Think about that. A demilitarized and neutral but unified Germany. This outcome would have seriously undermined the type of liberal order that the United States and the German allies were trying to achieve after the war. It would have been liberal but also democratic, right? And it would have rested uh, on, and it would not have rested on the form of anti-communism that Eikenberry uh, seeks to account for. Right? So this alternative order would have also resulted in a very different political security relationship with the United States. For Germany's entrance in NATO, the placing of NATO troops on German soil, and German rearmament, as well as the, uh, the nature of the Ger European integration process, all of these fundamentally rested on the active ostracization, marginalization of the left. Right? It's this ostracization of the left 
that's critically facilitated by the reincorporation of significant elements of the state and the non-state state apparatus into the administration and leadership of the new state. And we see that even before the breakdown of the wartime alliance, the Western allies had already preemptively moved to marginalize the left. Right? And this forecloses the possibilities of not only fulfilling the comprehensive uh, denazification program, but also an extensive democratization of state and society. And in, in particular, they rein in the scope, dramatically rein in the scope of the 4D program. So by 1948, three of the Ds, denazification, decartalization, and democratization, were heavily diluted. And with West Germany's uh, uh, entry to NATO in 1955, the final one, demilitarization, is effectively abandoned. Now, there are a number of factors hit inhibiting U.S. policymakers from really following through with this program. But of all of these, as Carolyn Eisenberg puts it in her meticulously researched book, the most overriding was the affinity of American business to Germany's old economic elites. Right? The affinity of, of American business to Germany's old economic elites. Elite and their unshakable conviction that only the experienced private owners and managers of capital were capable of restoring the country's productive apparatus. Not surprisingly, the other main factor is virulent anti-communism. Quoting her. And it's important not to dismiss the significance of this turn of events in Western Germany for the consolidation of the, of the social and ideological basis of this liberal international. For we find a, a very similar pattern occurring in a number of other states of the Western Alliance, such as France, Italy, and Greece. But the latter two actually uh, uh, necessitating U.S. interventions through covert and overt means in forcibly making sure that the communists don't come to power. Had these communists come to power in those states, we would have had a very different order. And they do so, again, by reincorporating elements of fascists, former fascists, collaborators, etc. Right? So we see here the active agency of these former fascists, of these former Nazis, of these collaborators, shaping the form of the international order that's being built. Now, of course, the fact that former Nazi officials are operating within a different political context doesn't mean that the German state after the war is fascist, right? We're not arguing that. We are arguing that, what we are arguing is that there's evidence to indicate that the liberal democratic character of the new West German state was heavily, heavily circumscribed by this constituent hostility to the left. And that this ensured that reactionary and far-right impulses remained at the heart of the way in which the state viewed and responded to the left in general and not just the communists. So another kind of example to look at the book, among many, many others, is one of the key anti-subversive laws uh, in the German states that specifically targets the left is actually drafted by former Nazi lawyers. Right? And this becomes key to the uh, one of the major laws being implemented. Right? This leads to the trial of thousands of leftists, in effect using the law to silence any of those willing to challenge the post-war anti-communist consensus. Right? So it's not just about punishing communists, but basically punishing anyone who is trying to question this anti-communist uh, uh, ideological orientation. And we compare this to the treatment of former fascists within these states that are essentially allowed to reorganize themselves into post-fascist parties and allowed to participate in the process, the republic's anti-communist pathology right, is central to its liberal democratic shortcomings. Okay, I was going to look a little bit or talk about a little bit of far-right inspired terrorist violence and coup plotting, uh, particularly uh, we look at the strategy of tension within uh, Italy, I don't know if you're familiar with that, between the uh, mid-1960s and late 1970s, and the ways in which we saw a former fascist uh, 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 being uh, implicated in that and their relationship with the state. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that because I'm running out of time, but I can put that in kind of a side note. <laughs> I can come back to it uh, later. Uh, we also talk about in the book uh, the fundamental role of NATO in securing and helping maintain far-right authoritarian dictatorships, such as those in Greece, Portugal, and Spain. We look in particular at the colonial's coup in Greece in 1967 and the instrumental role the U.S. played there, NATO played there. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that too much here, right? But what I want to just highlight is what, what, these, what these interventions reveal, what these type of interventions, right, what the, the use, the strategic deployment of far-right forces to fight off any potential subversion to the orders, what they reveal is that the U.S. global leadership 
that was much more common in the post-colonial world, the so-called third world, the global south, also uh, played out in some regions of Western Europe over the first few decades of the Cold War. And what our, our account then uh, tries to do is problematize this prevailing assumption that the US-led Cold War operated across two fundamentally distinct geopolitical zones, right? The kind of metropolitan democratic heartland in the Western Alliance and the so-called Third World. For the role of the far right in the organization operations of some Western European states' responses to radical social change is, a much, is suggestive of a much more mediated, uneven, and sometimes shifting separation between these two different zones. Right, which in key moments, right, in the key moments of hegemonic crisis, see the logic of U.S. foreign policy that plays out across the global south also playing out in parts of the liberal heartland. What our argument also suggests is that we need to reconceptualize hegemony in a way that's much more open to the differentiated social bases of its legitimation and of those source, social sources and social forces involved in it. Right? So we need to go beyond the kind of rather narrowly framed understanding of liberal orders articulated by Eikenberry, as well as others. Right? Because what we see is that the composition of social forces constitutive of the post-war order is persistently incorporating these far-right elements, right? these far-right agents and ideological currents that are even, at times, antithetical to liberal democracy. Yeah? But at the same time, they're integral to its veins, at least in certain moments of crisis. So I think it makes sense then to reconceptualize what Gramsci's concept of the historical bloc, for kind of just broadly social political alliances, the, it, it makes sense to reconceptualize the, so the historical bloc spearheading the U.S. liberal international order as representing a broader social penumbra of forces, including the far right, that orbit around a hardcore of liberal social forces progress. I'm going to give a more details of that in tomorrow's lecture where I'm going to be talking uh, and demonstrating how white supremacist uh, far-right elements of the southern United States were actually integral to the making of the New Deal coalition that then spearheaded the uh, liberal international order and the designs in Roosevelt and Truman's uh, administration. So we're going to be talking about that tomorrow. So with respect to neo gramscian accounts, the crucial point is that Always and everywhere, this relationship between coercion and consent is conjunctural condition. In times of crisis, or even in times of perceived crisis, the course of aspects come to the fore. Right? And throughout much of the Cold War, state-sponsored violence and terrorism by far-right agents remained uh, uh, fundamental in consolidating and reproducing these liberal democratic regimes. Okay. So far from re representing an opening up of domestic de democratic possibilities, as Eikenberry and others suggest, we argue that U.S. hegemony was founded upon the active and persistent limiting of acceptable democratic options and did so in ways that actively utilized far-right forces. Right? So we see the exclusion of more radical and more democratic alternative conceptions from the outset. Thus, capitalist hegemony should be conceived as structuring the field of legitimate political options it both limits the range of le legitimate political strategies and therefore also the depth of acceptable democratic change. And in this respect, at least, the U.S. Cold War order shares some uh, uh, similarities to the authoritarian liberalism of the or Ordo liberals of the interwar German period, those who were kind of influenced by Schmidt's work. And we see that in moments of crisis, it relies upon authoritarian social forces and means in sustaining and defending the rule of law and private property against radical democratic alternatives. So the pluralism of this post-war order was therefore always a bounded pluralism. At the same time, of course, we also have to recognize the scope within liberalism for extending the reach of what is acceptable, for expanding the reach of other democratic possibilities. But here that, of course, is a question of political agency. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you.